And for the first time, uh, watching the Cowboys, I'm trying to remember the last time I wanted the defense on the field for entertainment purposes mm. to watch. I'm trying to think of the last time defensively that well, I probably f- earlier this year with Diggs. Yeah, but I was more excited still for the offense because they were humming. They were the number one offense in the league, throwing it around everywhere. I'm trying to think of past teams. Dak said this is the best defense he's played with in his six years. Like, what other – I mean, we haven't had a talent like Parsons. Uh, no. The, I mean, the, 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 someone being in a zone like like Diggs hasn't no, happened. No, no. I don't no. know if it's happened in, in, in our decade here. Oh, no, it hasn't happened. Doing the no, show. No, 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 it hasn't happened. Not yet. like this. Not even close. Um, you know, when – I mean, even back – going back to Parcells' tenure here, you know, the defense was the better unit. Like when they went to the playoffs that way, I think the defense was better than them when they had Quincy, better than the offense. Uh, but that's because as a whole, the team was just void of talent, period. They didn't have defensive stars. Yeah. Um, now you had Roy Williams for a minute. He was a good player for a little bit. Uh, he was elect, you know, he, he put some big hits on you and. Uh, and they had DeMarcus Ware then a little bit later as, as a young kid. He was dominant. But by the time Ware got to the point where he was like an elite all-pro, you know, they had Romo. And Romo was the star of stars. So it's been a long time. It's been since – and I've, been, I've lived here for 24 years now. And I've never seen it. I've never seen the defense do this. Not right? even close. And yesterday, I wanted them on the field. I'm like, get the offense off the field. I'm tired of this. Uh, I'm tired of the, the screens. I'm tired of the third down passes for three yards on third and nine. I'm tired of Dak air mailing throws. Uh, tired of not getting anything on the ground with the run game. I'm like, just get Parsons and Gregory and Tank and Diggs back out there. And for the first time with this team, because I wouldn't allow myself to believe it a couple weeks ago after like the Kansas City game, and then especially you had the bad performance against the Raiders. Mm. I'm saying, can this defense actually lead the way to close out this regular season into the playoffs? Is the defense going to have to carry the offense? Like yesterday, I actually gave it, and I'm still going to continue to give it serious consideration with the way things are going right now. Now they need to do it consistently. See, the thing is, it's going to be tough to judge it against the Giants. Like, let's say yeah, you, you go can. out here yeah. and have this performance against the Giants. You're like, oh, whoop de doo mm-hmm. right? And then you get the football team again, and then you get Philadelphia, and you get the one test against Arizona. So there's a chance we could be fooled going into the playoffs yes. by the defense, and then all of a sudden the Rams and, and, and Stafford and Cooper Cup put up 30 on you. Like, there's a, it's going to be hard, um, except for the Arizona game, and I don't know what their status is going to be, or the Cowboys' status in terms of resting guys or not. It's going to be hard to get an absolute feel for the defense with some of the scrubs in the division coming up. Well, look, if if, if this team's going to win a title, it, the offense is what's going to carry them there. It's not the the defense is not going to carry them there. This is not this is not the Tampa defense last year. This is not the uh, the Broncos defense from a couple of years ago. If they're going to win the title, it's going to be because Dak gets right and figures it out, figures it out. There's too many good quarterbacks in the NFC yeah. for this defense to be able to... I mean, look, if they play Tampa again, is Tampa scoring 30? Uh, Probably. Probably. <laughs> uh, is Arizona going to... If they play Arizona in the playoffs, is Arizona going to score 28? Yes. Then the defense ain't going to carry them. It's the offense. It's the offense that's going to carry this team to the Super Bowl. It has to get right. The defense can do their part. Uh, yesterday, they could have had five picks. Yeah. Brown dropped one, maybe two. Uh, there was a couple that were tipped up in the air that that, that, that fell between three defenders. I mean, Diggs if, if, almost had one. Parsons almost had one. I'm not a, saying yeah. they were absolute should haves uh, with Parsons and Diggs, yeah. but the first Anthony Brown one probably should have like, been. Like, if a little bit of luck went their way. Yeah. They would have gotten a couple. Yes. Now, granted, the Gregory pick, that was probably a little bit lucky. Right. So it, it evens out there a little bit, but, you know, the defense could do their part by being opportunistic. Yeah. But, you know, to, in the NFC, in order for the defense to carry them there, 
They probably got to beat Tampa 17-9. to That's not going to happen. Not gonna, no, but Tampa's not scoring nine points. Well, let's start with, I mean, although you could go any number of directions, since week nine, Micah Parsons has nine and a half sacks. That's the most in the NFL. 16 quarterback hits. That's the most in the NFL. 10 tackles for loss. That's the most in the NFL. Three forced fumbles. That's tied for the most in the NFL. You have to go so far back on some of these things in terms of like Micah Parsons is the first rookie with at least one sack in six straight games since 1980. The nine and a half sacks in the last six games are the most by a rookie in a six game span since Leslie O'Neill in 1986. That's 35 years ago. So if you're having to backtrack 35, 40 years of NFL history, I look back at Lawrence Taylor, 1981, being the only rookie to ever, or the only defensive rookie to ever win Defensive Player of the Year. I guess that makes sense. And so maybe it can happen. The, you know, listening to Brad Sham talk about him this morning and like the comparison to Lawrence Taylor. Uh, and then, you know, having brought that up with Broadus last week or maybe two weeks ago and kind of like, hey, what is what is this? Can you compare him to him? And he's like, he was just a straight edge guy in a 3-4 defense. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a 3-4-4-3 three, four, four, three defense. This is whatever Dan Quinn decides right. is the best matchup. And you, when you kind of have that, uh, I, I always love, everybody does. Everybody loves Bruce Lee's be water. And that's what the their defense is. Their, water, their defense is water. And and they they move around, they're all over the place. And I think finally people got to see the when you put Randy Gregory and Demarcus Lawrence on the field and a healthy Neville Gallimore and the other guys in front of him, where where's he gonna be? Where's he coming from? And that this is the the idea. This is what you have. He can cover, he can make plays downfield. You saw him almost get an interception downfield yep. a couple different times. He can do all those things, but then on the rare occasion, or maybe you say, you know what, we're just going to bring heat all day. He's getting to the quarterback faster, and look what happened. Demarcus Lawrence is getting to the quarterback. Now, when they have to think about Micah, all the other guys are better because Micah's out there, and he's better because they're out there. This is a very good thing for what this team is, but man, he's I don't know if there is a definable label to put on him at the moment because there might not be a comp for him as a player. I can't believe we drafted, after we traded down to 12, maybe the best defensive player in the NFL. Like That's just amazing to me how great. And the Eagles traded become. up not to get him. In the second round, <laughs> a job. year before, we might have drafted in the second round a top five cornerback in the NFL. Yeah. Like This is, to turn around the defense, Like a lot of credit to the Jones family, to Will McClay, to everybody who said, I know that what they wanted and that why they traded out of the pick because they're like, crap, cornerbacks just got taken right in front of us that we wanted first. But to get this kid who, you know, a young man who might win, like he's legitimately in the conversation with Miles Garrett, with TJ Watt. It's probably down to three guys I'd for Matt, NFL Ju defensive players. Judon, I think Judon is, should Judon's be in that conversation in the too, okay. for All right. sure. Okay, okay. So, four, but yeah, five, there's, you know, yeah. throw it in my face. It's a great, you know? no, it's a Make great. Make me look really bad on the ring. <laughs> yeah, we went from three I'm to just, four. Your whole I'm argument has collapsed. So <laughs> I, I'm glad that you mentioned Matthew Judon because that seems to be where things kind of pivot. All right. You have, we have seen in the last 48 hours a huge swing in these odds. All right. Now keep in mind, it's significantly easier to find like MVP odds and stuff like that than it is defensive player of the year odds. But here is what I saw going into last week. We mentioned the Cowboys defense. They had two candidates for defensive player of the year in the top eight with Trayvon Diggs at three and Micah Parsons at eight. By the time we got to game time yesterday, Micah Parsons on some boards had moved up to sixth. This morning on FanDuel, and we'll get more odds as the week goes along because they don't turn these around as quickly as like MVP. Like I said, this morning on FanDuel, you can get two and a half to one on your money for Miles Garrett. That is still the favorite. You can get three and a half to one on your money 
for TJ Watt or Micah Parsons with Matthew Judon being fourth in a lot of these spots. So you are looking at a scenario in which in the span of four days, part of that time, Micah Parsons didn't even play a football game. Mm -hmm. He has went from eighth to sixth to tied for second in the betting odds for defensive player of the year. Does it always help for the most part for your defensive player of the year, offensive player of the year, MVP, that you're on a good team? Yes. Yes. And so when we look at Pittsburgh, they're probably not going to make the playoffs. Also, Watt got hurt. I don't know how hurt Watt is Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the rest of the season. And then when you look at Miles Garrett, right now they're fighting to make the playoffs. The Cowboys, I know they haven't technically clinched, but they're going to be a top four seed. They're going to win their division. So I, I wonder how much that will help. I think it hurts a little that he's a rookie when it comes to voting because they might say, hey, we have 10 more years to vote for this guy. But Lawrence Taylor's the only guy. Right. But I'm just wondering when it comes down to maybe tiebreakers here, when you're looking, I'm wondering if he turned a pathetic defense, one of the five worst defenses in the NFL last year, into one of the 10 best defenses in the NFL, and he's the difference. I know that Diggs is also a difference. I get it. There's Everybody's making a difference. But he's the major difference on this defense, how much credit he will get uh, that they went from one of the worst teams in the NFL to one of the best teams, and then he is on a team that made the playoffs. Because if Miles Garrett and TJ Watt don't make the playoffs and Judon, you know, a little different there. But I'm just wondering if he gets a tiebreaker. The I, I guess you got four games left here with yep. uh, in the regular season, and Mike is at 12, 12 yep. sacks. And you play, you get to play Washington again. So he let's go ahead and give him two sacks there, right? Okay. Um, no, but like seriously, can he break the Javon curses? You think he's going to break Javon curses record? I do you I, think that I was some, shocked. What's the record again? 14, 14 and, a half. and a half. Do you think that is something on Dan Quinn's mind that he is looking at any of those numbers and saying, "Hey, I got to, I got to get you these opportunities," or because. The numbers are there. Like the dude gets on the field and he just goes and creates. He disrupts, like Jerry Jones said. But do you think that's something that he's like, okay, let's go now that we're here. Now let's go get that. Or do you th- even think he had that thought in mind uh, when the season started because he wasn't a pass rusher then? Not when the season started. And I definitely get your train of thought here. My my only concern on that front with Quinn is. Is he evaluating it strictly like that now, or is he having a meeting with just the defensive guys, and they're like, okay, check it out. We're going to need to win these football games. Mm, maybe. You know, like, it's unfortunate that that's where we're sitting at, but... Yeah, well, you have to be you have to be a, a serious defense the way your offense is playing. Yes. So, yeah, y'all have, to, y'all have to do your things, but I'm just trying to figure out... I think he can get 14 and a half. I think that's a definite... Uh, number that he can't attain. It's just how much do you want to commit to it, and can you do it in game flow without taking away from anything else you're trying to accomplish? Honestly, are you to the point now that whether you commit to it or not, it's gonna happen? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm honestly to the point where I'm like, you don't need to line them up off the edge. You don't need to line them up on a blitz going up the middle. Like somehow, some way, it's gonna happen. I think you get them in long, the uh, third and long situations, and you're just like, all right, let's go. And Here's where it could play out. He's at 14 sacks going to Philadelphia, and that game doesn't mean anything. You've locked in your position, whether it's the three or four seed. I'm, you know, because we're not going to be able to lock in the one seed by that game. So, I mean, let's just say you can't really do any better than four. You've locked in four. You can't catch the three other division winners. A lot of times you'll sit out some guys because you're like, hey, we're going to have to play next week and we might have to play Philadelphia. So would it be best to not really show them anything in this game to host them at home most likely the next week? But would you go, hey, let's play Mike of the first quarter or the first half and try to get him a sack to get him the record? I no chance. Like, absolutely. I, OK, well, and. I, I know why you're not. You don't want to risk it. I get it. But I also think I your think wisdom wrong. might win. I don't think you're wrong. I, I think I'm just doing it because I want the kid to have it, man. I want him to go out. I want whenever people look in the record books for Micah Parsons' name next to Dallas Cowboys to be at the top of the list because they drafted the right dude when everybody else passed on this guy. They got this one dude that was like, man, he turned out to be the best rookie. Now, 
this again goes to what Nate was telling me the other night. Y'all have to make sure that this dude stays hungry. He's always hungry. Yeah. And like the dude's doing push ups on the sideline after he went out there and strip sack somebody. But I, I, you're there showing is... up the coaching stats that stop <laughs> sitting me out in these plays. I'm just doing push ups over here if you do. I got too much energy. And <laughs> Leighton Vander is just kind of staring at him like, good, wow. That, that made me sad because there was a point when I was like, man, this game's getting exhausting. And like, I just kind of leaned further into my couch. And he's like, man, I need more work. I'm going to start doing push ups. The one thing that I did find interesting was and that it came from Dan Orlovsky. But shout out to Todd Archer giving credit as a great journalist does that they had run four running plays where they actually pulled somebody, an offensive lineman, and it got them 26 yards. And uh, apparently that was what you were good at for six weeks is the pin-pull concept where your tackle blocks down, somebody comes around, you give your guy a chance to get in space, and it's just gone away. They just stopped doing it. That's the prime example right there of a play caller and not a guy that has a scheme. Mm -hmm. He collects plays. He, he, he goes from game to game with ideas of, oh, well, let's do this because they're not good here. I understand taking advantage, but he, he doesn't have something that he can hang his hat on. His, his run game is something that he, he can't say, okay, if it's going bad, this is what I can go back to. You know, everybody, you know, everybody, you ask him about running the ball outside. They ask, you know, they ask Mike McCarthy, oh, it's a good question. Good idea. Yeah, good. You know. What's the problem? Then why do you run the ball between the tackles so much? You have backs right now. You have a back that's not healthy enough to run the ball. You know, you, you had three carries last week for 71 yards off toss sweeps. You had jet, you had, you put CeeDee Lamb in the backfield and ran him to the outside. You run the ball better to the outside, but this is it. This is a guy that is a play caller, a collector of plays. He doesn't have a scheme. He doesn't have anything that when it's going bad that yeah. he can go back to. And that was celebrated after the Atlanta game, but now you're seeing the other side of it. Yeah, he really doesn't. I mean, if you you ask him what, what's your scheme, what what do you what do you what do you really what do you believe in in your running game? He couldn't tell you. He couldn't tell you what his running game is. Hmm. Maybe he can. He's just sandbagging. Sandbagging theory. Well, he better figure it out because again, you, you're wasting a great defensive effort. You, are. you wasted a great defensive effort at Kansas City that could have won you a football game if you'd have found a way just to play a little offense. I mean, it's the outside runs, it's the pin and pull, and these things are working. And he's asked about it, and he sheepishly kind of says, "Yeah, you oh, know, maybe it's something yeah, to look at. Maybe it's something to look at. Yeah, I don't think he's an idiot, is what I'm saying. Maybe, maybe sandbag theory is a little too conspiratorial, right? It's just not adding up to me, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have, uh an answer for it other than <laughs> there's there's no way you're sandbagging in a race for a postseason positioning right it's a good answer there's no it way. is a good answer but uh crazier things have happened have they i don't know give me some time i'll try okay. to think of a couple <laughs> say give me what they are <laughs> I, maybe the uh, triangle what, thing bermuda triangle that's pretty crazy yeah i I kind of, you know, if you're if you're gonna play somebody like, okay, they're play they they're they're locked in, they they're playing Arizona. And say say for somehow, some way Arizona were to end up not winning the division and and maybe you would do something that you wouldn't show knowing that you're going to play them. You know, that that's that's the only thing of and that would be at the end of the season. That would be like, well, Arizona's now in the Arizona's now in the five hole. Yeah. You know, and we're 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 locked in the four hole here. You know, I think I think this is maybe what you get when you have a head coach who's been to the playoffs a long time and knows the value of holding things back. And they're thinking we probably can win a lot of these games with uh, a watered down approach. That's how good we are. And maybe they overestimated their ability to beat a team like the Raiders, but they also know they have a historic level of injuries. Are we going to overcome a historic level of injuries and get this first seed when Arizona, Green Bay, and Tampa are are really good teams and two of them playing crap divisions? The probabilities, if you pencil it out with the math, would say, are we getting a higher chance of winning the Super Bowl if they don't know what to expect when we get there, or by exhausting all of our resources in uh, probably what's going to be a failed attempt to get the number one seed? And I think you could come out with the deception winning over full speed ahead to the number one seed is giving you the better shot. While watching your quarterback struggle week in and week out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's because he's, at, at he's the, part of the he's part of this. See, at, at the end of these games, they're not just handing it off to end the game. 
They're like, work on something, right? And maybe that's part of the deception. Like, look at this at the end of the game and an obvious running situation they're passing. That could be a little bit of the sandbagging. Maybe they know they can't run. <laughs> that too. Well, yeah, I think you get down to the point where it's like, if you had to hand the ball off three times, they were not thinking they were going to get 10 yards. And so he had to he had to run the boot to try and get you know he had the play open the quarterback just made a terrible read yeah. never saw the guy I mean that that play should have been that play should have worked that should have been pass caught ball game that's what that should have been but your quarterback made a huge it made a made a terrible read he didn't he threw the ball yeah. right to the damn linebacker yeah you know you got to see those things. Yeah, that that was brutal, and the decision making by Dak is is really confusing at this point. I, I play think, caller hadn't been good either. Yeah, I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna let people just kind of let him go walk. You know, he's he stands up there and asks the questions and or answers the questions and really not answering the questions. But I get that that's his job. But anyway, like I said, you know, he he has to be better. You know, he Dan Quinn and those defensive coaches have figured out what's going on. That team, that that side of the ball has gotten better as the year's gone on. You started off great, and now you're playing like a bag of ass. <laughs> it's horrible, man. Yeah. So you know you need to kind of figure out what's going on over there. Yeah. You know is. you don't want to waste an opportunity of a team like you said. You finally found a defense. Yeah. You finally got some guys over there. You know, don't let them down. You know, heck, all the money's over on that offensive side of the ball. Figure it out. <laughs> 